Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In the ever-evolving landscape of global finance, important discussions about the future of currency and international monetary systems are taking place. One such conversation revolves around the Yuna coin, a concept introduced in the spring of 2023 that holds significant implications for the global financial structure. Lynette Tsang, a financial expert known for her in-depth analysis, delves into this topic, shedding light on its potential impact. Lynette Tsang begins her video by acknowledging the significance of being informed about new developments in the financial world. She highlights her commitment to discussing important topics that her viewers bring to her attention. The Ono coin, introduced in April 2023, forms the core of her discussion. Zhang immediately draws a connection to an earlier statement made by the head of the IMF, discussing the concept of a global central bank digital currency, CBDC, platform. She goes on to underline the importance of interoperability, a shared infrastructure to prevent the emergence of isolated settlement blocks, as a way to avoid economic fragmentation. Zhang interprets this as an effort to create a universal currency that transcends individual national currencies and trade agreements. This concept, she notes, contrasts with the popular perception of globalization breaking down as the financial system continues to globalize. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. In the spring 2023 meeting, and admittedly, I had not heard but I really always appreciate it when people bring things to my attention because at the minimum, I do look at them. And then if there's something to talk about, we're going to talk about it. And that's what we're doing today. So this was announced back in April of 2023. And I thought, how come I haven't heard about the unicorn? So I went in and looked. But in June, well, we had the head of the IMF come out and say, we are working hard on a global CBDC platform concept. So it kind of seems to tie in and we've looked at it before. And I've always said the SDR made the most sense because it's a it's made up of all different currencies and they could put every single currency in it, making it easy to have a local currency and a universal currency. We are working on a principle of interoperability, she said. Such concept would involve a shared infrastructure that would avoid the emergence of settlement blocks, which is the last thing we want to, avert, to avoid further economic fragmentation. So let me explain what they're talking about here. Because what she's saying is that, you know, we, what have we been hearing? We've been hearing about the breakdown of globalization, right? Now in the eighties, that's when that big globalization push started. I remember thinking to myself, cause I was a new stockbroker then. Yeah, I can see some problems with this. And of course, with the supply chains breaking down, et cetera, we saw the problems with it. So now what we're told is that globalization is breaking apart. But I've also shown you in the past where for all the talk of the globalization breakdown, we've got the financial system that is getting even more and more globalized. And that's what she's talking about here. Those settlement blocks would be just that group of currencies. So when you're looking at what the BRICS nations are doing, where they're agreeing to settle trade in each other's currencies, that's what she wants to avoid. So what they're trying to do is come up with a universal currency that everybody will use, and the IMF, oh, well, let's see who, we'll just get into this a little bit more and we'll see where this goes. This is really quite interesting. I could not find, but, oh, I misspelled. But anyway, I could not find any direct references to the unicorn in the IMF or at the World Bank. So that sent me down this rabbit hole. Uh, I've included those links so you can see for yourself. But in the 1960s, so this is from the white paper from the Unicoin. In the 1960s, the United States did not have enough gold to cover the dollars in circulation outside the United States, leading to fears of a run that could wipe out U.S. gold reserves. Let's talk about this statement for a minute, because there are a few things that really stand out to me. Number one, they're referencing a period of time when we were in flux, shifting from at least a quasi gold standard to a debt based standard. And when they say that there was not enough gold to cover the dollars in circulation, what actually was happening was that gold was fixed 
at $35 to an ounce. That was the Bretton Woods Agreement back in the 40s. But the U.S., in attempting to fund the Vietnam War and the other wars that were, were going on, but primarily in this case, the Vietnam War, they were printing more dollars and so they were not staying true. They were breaking the agreement that was agreed to in Bretton Woods. Zhang's exploration of the Uno coin leads her to investigate its historical context. Referencing a white paper from the Uno coin, she discusses the events of the 1960s when the United States faced challenges due to insufficient gold reserves to cover the dollars circulating internationally. Zhang contextualizes this by explaining that this period marked a transition from a quasi-gold standard to a debt-based standard. She emphasizes that claims of inadequate gold to support currency are misleading, as the solution lies in adjusting the currency's value against gold. The video takes a deep dive into the Bretton Woods system, where global currencies were pegged to the US dollar at a fixed rate of $35 per ounce of gold. Zhang explains how the system eventually shifted to a floating exchange rate system leading to the need for a robust monetary commodity to mitigate local currency depreciation and inflation. This sets the stage for the UNO coin's proposed role as a universal monetary unit. Lynette Zhang introduces the UNO coin's design and features. She highlights its color and provides insights into its underlying purpose, to enable trade globalization through international payment and settlement integration. Zhang raises a crucial point about the UNO coin's potential to tap into various asset accounts, including cash, savings, investment, and even liabilities such as loans. This, she suggests, could lead to convenient and seamless access to one's equity, enabling easy spending. When you hear somebody say, well, there's not enough gold to cover our currency, that's garbage. Because what needs to happen is the price of that currency, the price of gold in terms of that currency needs to be adjusted. The whole point of gold in creating fiscal responsibility is that it is finite, non-infinite, like the printing presses, which are completely infinite, right? I mean, they can do as many much of that as they want. So that's the first thing I needed to talk about in here. The world has learned the economic strains of the foreign floating exchange rate system. And we have talked about that too, because the Bretton Woods system pegged all global currencies to the dollar at $35 an ounce to gold. So after they reneged on that, we went to a floating rate system. And that's why I just recently did a video on how do you value a fiat money? And that's the way that you look at it. The floating rate system would be the U.S. dollar against, say, the Japanese yen or the U.S. dollar against any other currency or any currency against another currency. None of it really reflects purchasing power loss. Absent a monetary policy to the foundational international monetary system, completing the money system with a monetary commodity that could sustain, sustainably mitigate against local currency depreciation and inflation, like gold has been periodically adopted. So what, they attempt, what they're attempting to do is create a derivative of gold, which is exactly what this is, right? Except this has inflation baked into it. Let's move on. This is the unicoin. I'd like you to notice the color of it. We'll come back to that. Enter DCMA, which is a world leader in the advocacy of digital currency innovations for monetary authorities. So what do we see happening right now? We see global governments creating all of these regulations around cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. Brilliant to come out with one that is designed specifically for monetary authorities. It will be under a different set of rules. Digital Currency Monetary Authority. Okay. Our mission, so their mission, is to enable trade globalization through the monetary integration of international payments and settlements. That makes things so easy. It says on here, okay, I mean, this is really what these are about. It says Digital Currency Monetary Authority and Universal Monetary Unit. And then it says on both sides, Unicoin. Continuing her analysis, Zhang discusses the concept of multi-currency, where bilateral and multilateral trade agreements can be executed with ease. 
The video explores the potential of central banks holding multiple CBDCs on digital ledgers, mirroring the diversified nature of the special drawing rights, STR. Zhang points out that this would make cross-border wealth transfers more efficient, further blurring the lines between traditional and digital assets. She then turns her attention to the multi-gateway system, a mechanism that facilitates the transition from legacy payment systems to digital CBDC payment rails. This transition, Zhang explains, would likely be seamless, allowing individuals to engage with digital assets without noticing a stark difference. As the video nears its conclusion, Zhang brings attention to the World Economic Forum's often discussed vision of, you will own nothing. She links this notion to the potential consequences of the UNO coin and global CBCDs, suggesting that these developments could pave the way for a future where personal ownership is significantly reshaped. So really what I want you to understand is always, I don't care which currency system you're looking for, only gold has maintained and holds all of the pieces that you need to have a good money system. Will this have a good money system? No, it won't. And I, and I have to tell you, even though I haven't found anything in there, this is most likely, I mean, I thought it was absolutely a brilliant way to show you what this global CBDC is most likely to look at because you're going to have to have multi-ledger. Multi-ledger use cases include users being able to hold balances in different asset accounts, such as cash accounts, savings account, money market accounts, and investment accounts. Multi-ledgers can also support liability accounts, such as loans and accounts payable. So in other words, this new CBDC has to have its finger in every single pie that you or I attempt to accumulate. And it makes it a very convenient way for you to spend your equity. What I've heard over and over again is like, let's take your equity in a house. Let's say you have $100,000 equity in your house. If you're holding it on your phone, how convenient when you see this new shirt or this boat or this car, you got all of your wealth tied up here. You can access your equity. How easy is it to spend it? Especially with perspective management, perception management, nudging you in that direction. It's evil genius. That's what it is. Multi-currency enables bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and the ability for a central bank to hold multiple CBDCs on their digital level ledger. So again, like the SDR that is made up of a, of a whole bunch of different currencies, then that's what they're talking about for their modern day CBDC as well. So that means it can be used anywhere in the world. So pretty easy to transfer your, like say home equity to somebody in say China that's buying your equity after you bought that boat or what have you. So it makes wealth transfer around the world a whole lot easier. Multi-gateway enables the transfer of money between both legacy payment systems, which means what we're used to right now, and digital currency and CBDC payment rails, which would then make the shift into these digital assets and these digital CBDCs really seamless. You would not see it. So what they're talking about here is a best-in-class CBDC public monetary system, but best-in-class for who? For you? Because this is going to entice you so that at the end of the day, the World Economic Forum, you will own nothing, comes true.